Turn that up. Can you guys hear me well? I think we can put that back down here. Compress. Okay. Okay, everything is looking good. Not many students though, that's not good. Maybe it's people still rolling in from bed probably, let's be honest. How are we all going? Good, you chow, how are you? Oh, the sound is low in the science theater. Um, maybe someone can just go up and turn the volume up on the computer, feel free. I think I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty good. No, so this is coffee. I don't want to spill it everywhere. I made a long black today, but very astute olive, fake olive. I was just on a tea kick because you child gave me those nice teas. <laughs> That's... How's the sound in the science theater? Is that all fixed? Exactly right. Okay. Um, it's 10 04. Um, okay, a few little things. Um, that's great. Okay. A few little things. Um, so actually, uh, this is a, I think this is a, a good thing. Um, there's only one like m primary topic left in terms of lecture content for the term, which is what we'll do this morning. Get undo. Um, the reason that's a good thing is because it's important that the concepts get delivered early enough so that you've got time to work on, on the project. So, 
for the rest of the lectures, what we'll do, and there's only a few left, which is crazy, um, is we will do, let me get web CMS up. So today we will do um, undoing Git. So basically we'll just do a bit more, um, some advanced Git uh, stuff. Then we'll um, talk about the uh, iteration four or the individual project iteration. It's the same thing. We'll talk about what that's all got, you know, how that all works, what we expect, what you can expect and all of that. Um, and then we've got a couple of um, bonus um, lectures um, to talk about next week, but those aren't sort of important necessarily for the course. It's more for software engineering in, in, um, in general. We, I expect we're going to have some free time. Well, not free time. We're going to have some spare time after the Git Undo lecture this morning. So what I was thinking um, is that we can, re, we, re, we can cover some previous lecture content that you think uh, people you would benefit from um, having a recap over. So if there's anything, you know, in the course so far that you've been iffy on conceptually, um, start thinking about it. Um, and I'll do a poll at some point after the Git lecture and we can revisit that content. We don't have to necessarily redo the slides. We can just take another look at it, draw a diagram, you know, do something to, to go over that um, content. Does that sound good to everyone? Hopefully that wasn't too small. Yeah, we can definitely do those those topics, Loom. That's a good idea. Those that can be a bit tricky. Okay, so without further ado, we can we can talk a bit a bit more about some um, more advanced Git stuff. I was just thinking I might need my iPad for this one, but I'll get it if I need it. Um, now I'm assuming you will have run into some of these problems already because you've been working on the project with Git. So it's very common um, to make mistakes, basically. When you make mistakes with Git, um, depending on the situation that you're in, will um, change what you need to do to respond. This is the challenge, right? There's no simple answers for what to do. It's very contextual. So, but we can talk about the, the high level Something to my eye. The high level concepts that um, are important and some of the tools that we have it out, out um, available to get us out of trouble. Um, so basically, sometimes we make mistakes, we need to be able to resolve them carefully. The careful part is, is important. So three main ways that we can undo mistakes with Git. Um, a hard reset, a soft reset, um, and amending a commit. I actually want to start with amending a commit, but before we talk about that, um, God, what's my eye? Um, as you know, every time we make a commit, we're building on the chain of commit histories, right? Um, but what happens if we make a mistake in one of those commits? And especially what happens if that uh, commit was earlier in the chain of commits? Does that make sense? Um, we might not realize it till later on. Um, so we have a few tools to address this, git reset and git commit amend. Um, I want to start with git commit amend because I actually think it's um, the simpler tool that we have. I, I use it pretty often. Um, I don't know, is anyone using it? Has anyone used it? Okay, no. Okay, a lot of people saying no. Interesting. I thought maybe a few of you would have used it. Okay. So, git commit. Let me, you know what? I do want to get my iPad. Hold on. It's just, it's just here. And then my, where's the poster? Oh, God. Um, okay. 
Okay. Whiteboard. Oh no, don't tell me. Don't do this. Don't do this. Oh. Something is gonna make me get my phone. <sighs> Sorry everyone. Am I here? No. It's not connected. Okay, <laughs> is that working? Sorry about that. My, f my phone is the webcam, and then when Microsoft decides that... Um, you know, I am not who I say I am. It really gets annoying. Okay, so whiteboard... What's this one? Yep, okay, cool. All right, okay, so. Oh, what did I just do? Where did it go back? Okay. Okay, all right. Bear with me, everyone. So, we're making some commits. We're going like, do, 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 commit, do, 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 commit, do, do, do. One, two, three. So we're now here. So we make a commit here. This is a commit. We make this commit, you know, we take git commit. Then we start, you know, going off to work on our code and we realize that we, we did something in this commit that we shouldn't have done. So a common thing that I, I do here is I committed, uh, or I, I didn't commit a file in the commit that I wanted to commit. Or maybe I committed a file that I didn't want to commit. Or maybe I committed um, a change that I just didn't want to commit. Right? Now, if I've not pushed... It's, we're easy. We can just do a git commit amend. So let's just do a demo. I think that's just the best way of doing this. So let's make a... Should we make a fresh repo? Do we want to do that? Let's make a fresh repo. I'll just do something on GitHub. Okay, uh, 1531 demo. I'll make it public. Uh, let's create a repository. Okay, let's come here. Can you all see this nicely? Can you all see this well? Um, week nine, I'm going to go do git clone that repository. It's going to be an empty repository called 1531demo. I can cd into that directory and I'm in this directory here. Okay, nice. I can make a file called um, program.ts, whatever. Um, you know, main function, whoops. function main um, you know console.log hello world is fine oh, am I frozen or something okay no. can you all see this okay sorry
Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's make a um, just an initial commit, so we can go git status to see that we've got this program.ts file, which we haven't committed, so that's fine. Git add program.ts, git commit, I can just do, you know, initial commit. And I can do a git push here, and it's gonna push, and if I go to GitHub, this is the exact same as GitLab, I'm just using GitHub here, I get this program.ts file. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now let's say I wanna do, um, I, I wanna add something, I add some function, uh, my new function, right? And I go console.log, hello, you know, 15311 students. So I make a little typo here, but I don't realize it because I'm hurrying along. So I go git add program.ts. git commit, oops, dash n, add new function. And then I go, oh damn, I've made a mistake, right? This is meant to be 1531 students, but I've committed the problem uh, code. So what would you do? Maybe what you would do is, well, what, actually, that's a good question. What would you all do right now? You need to fix this. What are the, what are, what can we do? And don't just say like we can use amend because uh, we could just obviously use amend, but most of you are saying, all of you are saying you haven't used it yet. So what would you do right now? Yeah, exactly. Make another commit. Exactly right. That's super common. Um, if you don't really care about the commit history, and we should always care about the commit history, but if it's a little toy project, whatever, we're just smashing through some hack, um, you could just fix it, add it, commit it, and um, push it, and it, will, and it will be fine. Although, what will happen is, in the history of the commits, right, as you all know, you'll have three commits. The initial commit, the commit that added the function, I didn't, yeah, the commit that added the function and the commit that added the fix. And it's just a bit messy to have three commits for two changes. Does that make sense? We don't want this change to stay in the history. We don't need it to stay in the history. So what we can do is git commit amend. Um, Why don't we pull up the um, documentation on it? So this is the Atlassian um, page on git commit amend right here. It's a convenient way to modify the most recent commit. Okay, that's quite cool. It lets you combine staged changes with the previous commit instead of creating an entirely new commit. So really simply what you do is you fix the bug Right? This could be one change, multiple changes. You add it. So git, oh, let's do a git status first. So we can see that there's a modification to this file. Obviously, um, if I do a git diff, you can see that I've fixed, right, the typo. Okay, so I'm happy. Now, I add the file, git add program.ts. But instead of making a new commit with a message, what do I do here? So I'm making a commit, but I'm not making a new commit. So what would I do here? Anyone? <coughs> Go on. What do we think we do at this point? So we've fixed the change, we've added the change. What could we do? Is 
Is this like... Exactly, we can do the git amend. Exactly right. So we do git commit dash amend, just like that. Git commit dash amend. Oh, it's, sorry, it's double dash. It's double dash. Git commit, git commit double dash amend. I do that. And it's... Um, what it does is in your default git text editor, it brings up the previous commit. And it lets you modify that commit um, message. So remember the message was add new function. You ign it ignores everything with the hashes. This is just information for you. Most of the time, so when we're fixing the contents of the previous commit, we don't actually want to change anything here. So I can just close that. And you can see it made, it, it changed one file. So if I do git log here, I have the initial commit. I have the add new function. So I don't have three commits. I've only got two commits and it's got the correct version. Now, what's remaining for us to do here because we don't have it on the remote repository. What's left to do? Our lecture chat's so quiet today. What's going on? Is this like boring or is it, do you not, are you not sure? What's going on? <laughs> Help me out. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. We need to push it, exactly. So git push, we can just do a git push and it's going to push up those changes. We refresh, we have add new function. We can look at that. It adds 1531. We don't see ever that it added the typo 15311. Okay. That's like the most simple um, git commit amend. So is there any questions on, on that usage of git commit amend? Any questions? Okay. Um, why don't we do that now? Another uh, useful. So amend basically appends your newer changes to the current staged commit. It doesn't append them. It replaces the commit with the stage, staged changes. But yeah, exactly. So here's another super useful application of amend. Right, so let's say I add a third function, my newer function. There's nothing wrong with the code, like I'm really happy with this. I go git, uh, git add program, git commit dash m, add new function. Um, and then I go, oh god. I've put a typo, not in the code, but I've put a typo in the, the, the commit message. Now, I'm, I'm certain all of you have done this, including me. I do this all the time. We make a typo in the commit message itself. This is really annoying. Um, there's something really unprofessional about typos in commit messages. Um, when I'm reviewing open source contributions to my projects, if there's typos in the commit messages... It's not that like we, you want to be an asshole and it's not good enough or whatever, but it's kind of an indication that the attention that, to detail is not there. Does that make sense? And that you need to um, take a look at what's going on. You, you can't necessarily trust it. But we're all human. We make mistakes. How can we fix this? Well, if you remember, git commit amend lets you edit 
whoops, I'm in Vim here, so I gotta edit the actual commit message. And then when I push this, I never had the bad commit. In fact, I could edit again to make that A a capital. Right, that's, if that's how I wanted it. Um, and I can edit multiple times. Now, here's something slightly different though. I've edited the most recent commit, but I had already pushed this commit. Do we see that? So I'm changing this commit to A with a capital A, add new function. I can do it locally, like no problem. I already committed this, uh, this uh, amended this commit. But what's going to happen when I push this? Because when I push this, it's going to like amend this commit, but this commit is already being pushed. This is something that's going to happen. So anytime that you push changes and then you need to amend the most recent commit, you're going to run into this problem. Let's see what happens when I do the push. It's going to tell me I can't push it. I can't push it because um, the updates were rejected because the tip of your current branch is behind the remote counterpart. So basically what it's saying is your most recent commit and the remote's most recent commit are different and I don't know how to push. Like, I don't know what to do. Git doesn't know which is newer, which is the correct change. However, <coughs> excuse me, the solution in this case is very simple. Um, we know that we want our amended commit. This is the pre-amended commit. So what I can do is a git push, and you've got to be very careful with this, but is a git push force. And what that says is just ignore the commit here um, and replace it with my amended commit. Um, I want to be very clear here. The only time you should do a git push force, well, not the only time, but one of the only times I ever do a git push force is in this exact circumstance where I'm only just fixing a recently pushed um, commit that needs to be amended. Git push force will rewrite history. So you need to be very careful. If you force push and lose stuff, you can potentially lose it for good. Anytime you, you use dash dash force in Git, you're getting into dangerous territory and you want to slow down and make sure you know what you're doing. Okay. Um, is there any questions with that? I think that's everything we need to cover for git commit amend. Uh, you can put a message after the amend as well. In what cases would you want to commit but not push? Do you mean git commit amend and not push? You always want to push, but what I mean is that if you need to override a remote push, you got to be careful with force. Okay, let's do a little poll to see if we're ready to move. So push force overrides the repo's history with your local branch commit history. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So if you're really, if your local history is really um, veered, veered off, you can do some damage. That's right. You got to be careful. They probably um, talk about it here. Okay. Um.
I'm trying to search here, but it's not coming up. Um, yeah, okay. This is very important. We need to talk about this. Um, surely it's safer just to make another commit then. Um, y yes, in, in most... So the, the only time... Um, let's end the poll. Let's talk about this fake olive. Okay, so 9% uh, not sure, 36% okay, 54% good. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> so the only time I would do a force push with an amend is if I know I'm working... Like if I've just made the mistake, like I've just done the push and no one else is pulling my code. Like if I'm just, if I'm working on a solo project, for example, it's okay. This um, message here is very important. Never do it, okay, if other people have already taken your, um, your commits, right? The bad commit that you're going to amend. Amended commits are new, are entirely new commits, and the previous commit will no longer be on the current branch. This has the same consequences as resetting a public snapshot. Avoid amending commits that other developers have based their work on. Um, you'll get into trouble because they have based their work on the pre-amended commit, which is a different commit, and then you change it, and now you've got two different histories, and you'll get into to strife. Um, so never do it if someone else has already taken it. If no, if you know that no one else has already taken it, like you did it a few seconds ago and you just want to clean it up, you can do it. Um, or if you've not pushed, then it's, it's obviously completely fine. Um, if you're in doubt, it's better just to make another commit. I kind of agree. If you're not sure, you know, it's your first week on the job, maybe be careful, ask someone that you're working with because your, your um, you know, workplace will have specific rules for what you like and don't want to do. Cool? Uh, so git commit dash dash amend dash m message. Does message contain the commit message? No, no, no. So message contains the, the uh, new commit message. So what you want to replace the previous commit message with. We didn't actually do that in the demo, but like, let's say I go git log here. I've got add new function. Here is the head. Um, initial commit, add new function. I can go git commit amend dash m and I can just give a new message like uh, add newer function. And then if I do the git log, you can see that's been renamed to add newer function. How do you unstage files from a commit? Good, good uh, question. In fact, great question. Let's talk about Git reset. Um, git reset is how we actually do that. Fake olive. That's how we can um, unstage files from a commit. We're going to go through the Atlassian article on it because it's really good. Um, and there's two types of git resets, hard and soft. We're going to talk about both. Um, I think this one's good with the whiteboard again. So let me talk about it. So you got a, you got a series of commits. Oh, before I do that, we're good to move on to reset. We're all good with amend. Yes. Okay. Cool. So, let's go to the whiteboard. So, here we have some commits. Um, and as you should hopefully all know, every commit is um, 
associated with a hash, or basically is a hash, right? So we have this like hash, you know, one, two, three here. This would ha have like a, some other hash, like one y x two blah 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 whatever. And this has like two five one one, uh, you know. Every commit has some sort of unique identifier, <coughs> which we call the hash. What a um, hard reset is is a very simple concept. It's the simplest of the git reset concepts. So every every um, git project has some commits. The commits have a hash, and we have this um, the current commit, right? The head commit, and then the log follows that commit. We're all following so far. Am I making sense? This is what all Git repos basically look like. You've got the parent commit over here, and you've got the history of commits behind it. I might decide that this entire commit was completely screwed up. I made irreversible damage. Um, the whole thing was a waste of time. I don't want the changes. I was in a fever delirium state and everything I did was absolute garbage and I just want to pretend that this commit never happened and go back to commit number two. Have you ever been in this circumstance? Many times? Yes, okay, cool. Okay, so what git reset hard does is very simple. You give it, so you, you type git reset hard. You give it the hash of the commit that you want to reset to. In this case, it would be this one. And git will just pretend, like it will just completely eradicate this and set and reset the project to point to this commit. Very simple. <clears throat> Very simple, but pretty dangerous, right? Because you're losing everything. If you give it the wrong commit, like if you give it this commit, you will lose commit number two. You can sort of reset multiple um, commits. What about the changes you made after commit three but didn't stage? So if you didn't stage, I think they still say, no, if, they, if you didn't stage them, they're gone. We'll do some demos and we'll, we'll see what happens. Do we want to do a demo of this one then? All right, so. Let me push this just to quick clean this up. So if I view the log, I've got, um, Initial commit, add new function, add newer function. So I've got three commits here, and I might say that this entire commit, this newer function, was a waste of time. And I mean, it sort of is a waste of time. Um, if you look, the console log is exactly the same as this one, and I just, I don't know why I wrote this. I don't need it. I hate it. Um, I'm an awful developer, and um, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm a charlatan. So we want to reset to this point in time. So the first thing we need to do is actually copy this commit hash. This is the hash right here. So when we type git log, we see the actual hash or the ID of that commit. And then pretty simply I go git reset dash dash hard and I paste the commit that I want to reset to. And when I do that, you can see my file reverted back to the point in time at which this commit um, was the head. So if I type git log now, we only have two commits. Do you see that? It's gone. It's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful, pretty simple. Now, we're in the same position as earlier where if we look on um, the remote repository, we still have all three functions. 
What do you think will happen when I do a, a normal git push now? Let's say I want to push these changes up. What, what do we think is going to happen? Is that better? Do you think it's going to be able to push no problem or is it going to run into a problem? Uh, you think we'll run into a problem? Yeah. Why? Why though? Why do you think we'll run into a problem? I agree with you, Henry. What's the problem going to be? So to remind you, we have two commits here. And we have three commits here. Um, it's not updated from the repo. Yeah. There's, there's, there's commits here that don't exist Oops. Don't exist locally. So if I do a git push, it's going to tell me that I can't do that because, <coughs> excuse me, the tip of your current branch is behind the remote counterpart, which totally makes sense. There is a new commit on the remote branch that does not exist locally. So how do we override that? We, we sort of did this earlier. And again, you've got to be really careful when we do this. Yeah, we could do a force push. Yep. And it just says like, forget everything on the remote. What I've got locally is what you need to have on the remote branch. So it's pretty, uh, it can get us into a lot of trouble. Now, <coughs> excuse me, that's not the only time you might want to do a hard reset. <laughs> Sussy. Um, good morning, AR11. You're a bit late. I don't know if I can forgive you. Um, we don't always need to force push after doing something like a reset or an amend. It might be that I'm switching to a new branch and I want that new branch to have a different history. So I could you know, branch off my branch, do a git hard reset and then push to the new branch and I won't need to do a force push, right? So it's not always that we need to do a force push. In fact, you should, if you know what you're doing, you should probably always avoid ne needing to do a force push. Okay. But that that's the, that's the general concept of git reset hard. It's really simple. You take a commit that you want to be the most recent commit you put that hash ID in and that is the most recent commit now. Everything that happened afterwards, it just, you pretend it never happened. <coughs> um, one second. Okay, um, Han says, how do we know what the hash ID is? Pretty simply, you do a git log and you can copy the hash ID. That's what we just did before in the demo. The stove's working. The stove's back. Yep, the stove's back. We're good. We're good. That was that was good fun. Yep. Um, okay. <coughs> Here's another um, way that I use... A git reset hard, for example. Oh, let's, you know, maybe let's go to a big project. Let's go to a bigger project. So this is a project that I work on. 4,000 commits. Let's say, um, let's say, oh, when would you do this? Maybe this isn't a good example. Yeah, that's not a good, ignore me. We'll talk about that another time. Um, 
Okay. Oh, where were we? Yeah, so this is saying, I want to go back in time. I don't care about anything that's happened <coughs> since the point I'm going back to. <coughs> Excuse me. It's pretty drastic. you got you got to be careful. It's pretty severe at Get Reset Hard. Oh, yeah, you can't force push to many of the repos we provide you. That's true for security. In fact, many, many industry projects, for example, won't let you force push to, like, the remote upstream repo. You can probably do it to your own forks and things like that. Obviously, force pushing can cause some serious problems. I probably shouldn't talk about it so much, but I do use it sometimes, so it's good to know. <coughs> You know, but what you could do, for example, is do your git reset, do your git commit amend, push to a new branch that doesn't have the bad history, and then pull request that in, for example. That's probably a better way of doing things. All right, is there any more questions on git reset hard? Now, uh, so someone had a good question. Okay, yes, fake olive. What about changes you made after commit three, but you didn't stage? So let's let's do this. So let's um, add this new function back. Git add program. Git commit add newer function. So we're going to add this function back. What? Oh, I didn't save it. That helps. Git add. <coughs> git commit. Okay, we have it here. Um, let's do a git push, and that's going to work, no problems. Um, what was I saying now? Okay, so now I think what someone, what a fake was saying was so changes you made after commit three, but you didn't save. So let's say I fix this problem here. So I've made some changes and I think now I do it, <coughs> now I do a reset to this point, get reset hard uh, like that. Yeah, it just completely ignores anything that's unstaged. It's all destroyed. You completely go back to that point in time, fake olive. So yeah, that's the other thing you got to be really careful about is if you have unstaged... So you might make a new file that's got something useful in it, but then you want to reset back to a previous point in time. If you get reset hard, you'll lose that file if you didn't stage it. I feel like these lectures are behind the major project. I feel like I picked these skills up. I mean, that's good that you picked them up. <laughs> a few people haven't. I mean, um, a lot of people haven't seen some of these stuff, so... You can get away with a lot of the git stuff without doing amends and hard resets. Um, and they're just useful in general. There's this bit of a balance between like making the lectures support the project, which is obviously what we do, but also just making lectures that are helpful to be a software engineer. Do you know what I mean? Like we can't always align what we teach with assessment. It's still really useful to learn some stuff for your career. Anyway. Um, uh, we're not attacking AR11. It was a fair comment. Uh, Self-learning is one school. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a good thing that you've you've figured some of this stuff out. Um, all right. Soft resets are a little um, more nuanced. Let's read the description. Keeps all of your current code the same, but just changes. Well, that's not very good English. But just changes about the commit you're pointing to. Um, Oh, sorry, but just changes what commit you're pointing to. Pointing to a new hash. That was fine English. Ignore me. This is used for saying, like, I like the code I have, so let's not change anything, but I want to alter history of the commits that got me here. So let's look at soft and read the Atlassian document. When the soft argument is passed to a reset, 
The ref point is updated and the reset stops there. The staging index and the working directory are left untouched. This can be hard to clearly demonstrate. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's continue with our demo and prepare it for soft reset. Okay. Well, we're not doing that demo, so I don't know how much sense that's going to make. Um, but why don't we... Yeah, I don't think it's that hard to, to explain. So let's go git log. We've got, I think, three commits here. No, we don't, because I undid it. Yeah, of course. So let's get that commit back. <laughs> no, I don't think it's going to make you make anyone think you did more commits. Um, all right, so git, com, uh, git add program.ts, git commit add newer function. Okay, so we're back to this point in which we've got three commits, uh, initial commit, add new function, add newer function. function. So we're happy with all of this. We come across and we say, okay, I need a new file here. Um, you know, my, func uh, my file.ts and in my file I can do like function. For example, in fact, I might say, okay, I want to actually move this function into um, its own file, okay? So I take this, this code here and I put it in um, this separate file. And this is what I want. I want this separate file here. But for example, I no longer, I never should have added the function to this file. It never should have gone here. Let's read the demo again. Yep. So, do we understand the circumstance? I never meant to add the function to program.ts. I, I wanted to do this, add it to my file. So what do I want to do? I want to reset to this commit. I never wanted to, to, to have this commit add newer function. But I don't want to delete this file, which is what a hard reset would do. Does that make sense? I want to keep my unstaged changes but pretend that that, re that commit never happened. Well, not pretend. I want to will it so that this commit never happened. Are we following? And so what we do is really s s the, exactly the same. We copy the commit that we want to be the most recent commit. No, no, it updates it locally, fake olive. So fake off says, so it updates it on the repo, but not locally. So this is all local. This is all local. We have three commits. The third commit was to add this function here. I've now moved this function into its own file, which is what I initially should have done, but I never should have made this commit. I don't want this commit to exist. But if I do a hard reset down to here, I will lose this change because it's unstaged and all of that. So I can do a soft reset. I can reset to this commit, but softly. I'm not removing my working changes. So I go git reset soft, and I paste in the commit that we want to move, that we want to go back to. But I'm doing a soft reset, so I won't remove my working changes. Did that not work? Did I do the right commit? Okay. Yes, that's worked. Okay. So let's look here. Do you see that the add newer function is gone? It's not in the history. Right? So that commit has been removed. I've got my change here, which is what I wanted. And it means that I can remove this commit, this change from program.ts. So git reset soft leaves uncommitted changes in the repo. Exactly right. It leaves like everything the, the way it is. 
even the commit that came in that new cha- in, in, uh, the changes that came in that new commit it leaves everything the way it is but it removes it resets the commit history regardless does that make sense so now what I can do is go git commit sorry uh, git add everything git commit um, I can do that add newer function right the correct the correct add newer function but add newer function now is in my file it's not in program.ts yeah it's up to you to do everything it, it doesn't touch your contents staged or unstaged you have to fix it but it does let you go back to a previous commit fix what you were meant to fix like do it the right way and then you can do a push it wipes the commit history, but doesn't change any code. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, it's super useful if you've been working, you've been making a, a few commits. Um, the code, the changes are good, um, but something is wrong with the commit. You've made too many commits, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, git commit, uh, git add dot it just means add all changes. Yeah. It's probably not good to use. You gotta be careful with it. <laughs> I should have added the file manually. Um, and if you saw, right, I had this unstaged uh, change and it, it brings it along with you, um, ready to go. Pushing is exactly the same situation as we've always been in. If we've got a conflict with the remote branch that we're going to need to do a force push or push to a branch that doesn't have those changes. So if I do this, git push, it's going to have a problem because... I changed the history and the repo uh, had the the incorrect um, the incorrect one. So we could do a git push force, for example, to override it. Yeah, yeah, this is they're not necessarily good commit messages. This is just a demo. Okay, um all right. Han says, wait, can't we just copy and paste the code to the new file and do git commit? Why did we do a git reset soft? Because Good question. Because program.ts had the function and it was never meant to. So if you copied and pasted it, if I copied this, or if I, let's say I cut it, I cut it, I cut it, I deleted it, I added it here, I made a new commit, there would be a commit in the history where this file, this code was in this file. Whereas that's no longer the case now. There was no point. What's going to happen here? There was no point in the history where this code was in this file now because I did a reset. That makes sense, Han. So a git reset soft is is still changing um, the history. It's altering the history of commits that got me to this point that I'm happy with. <laughs> That's okay. Um, here's another way of explaining it, maybe with the whiteboard. How's everyone else going with the tips? Uh, and that effectively deletes the commit which reversed change everywhere. It, it re it, remember when we do a hard reset, it goes back to that um, commit and just deletes like everything that happened up to the point that you're resetting to. A soft reset does the same sort of thing, but it keeps all the changes in from every commit and that's unstaged. So let's do a little whiteboard here. We've got git one, two, 
three, four. So we've got some commits here. This is the head commit. This might have added, you know, one dot ts. This added two dot ts, like some files. This added three dot ts, and this added four dot ts. So we added four files here, one one for each commit. If I do a hard reset to this commit. What's going to happen? If I do a hard reset to git commit one, to commit one, what files will remain? Someone uh, answer that. Exactly right. Two, three, and four, all completely gone, deleted. Maybe forever, because they could be on a remote branch. But yeah, that's exactly right. All that remains will be 1.ts. Han, does that make sense to you for a hard reset? Reduce to atoms, exactly. Obliterated. Thanos snapped. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, great. What if I do a soft reset? What's going to happen? I'll show you what will happen. I'll have, well, okay, can you answer this, Han? What commit will I have? What will the commit history look like? Exactly right. Uh, are you talking, Han? Are you talking about the file or the commit? Let's just talk about the commit. Let's just talk about the commits first. What will the commit chain look like? Not the files. Let's just talk about the commits. Uh, no, that's not correct. You're still doing a reset. You're still doing a reset. So the commit chain is going to look just the same as a hard reset. So when we do a hard, when we did a hard reset, what commits would I be left with? Just the commit number one. When I do a soft reset, that's exactly the same. So I'm I'm still going to just have this one commit. I'm going to reset to this commit. I'm going to lose this commit, this commit, and this commit. So it's the other way around. Does that make sense? I'm resetting back to the point in history where I was over here. With the hard reset though, I delete. Oh, oh my God, what is this tool? Yeah, that's what I wanted. Jesus. With a hard reset, I delete everything that came after. I pretended this, I'm doing a soft reset now. With a hard reset, I delete everything that came after and I delete it. That's a hard reset. Okay. Why would that do it one by one? For a soft reset, what happens? In fact, that's not true. Oh my God. A soft reset, I still do the same thing Right, like I still, oh my God, I hate this tool. Oh my God. <laughs> Where's just like a square selector? What? Where's like a normal selection thing? Okay, this is not going well. All right. This is what I wanted. 
a soft reset keeps all the files but resets the commits. Oh, that's all I wanted to show. Okay, oh, so if you wanted to do a hard soft reset to commit one for, for hard reset to... Uh, exactly right, exactly right, exactly. That's it. Exactly right. So you're like, the work that I've done is good, but the commits were bad. Let's reset the commits, keep the work. With That's a soft reset. With a hard reset, it's like, no, everything's bad. The commits are bad, the work's bad, I'm bad, the weather's bad, like everything's bad, the economy's bad, inflation's bad, everything, just reset everything. Delete it, destroy it. And it sort of makes sense in the name, right? Like soft is like, mm, I'm gonna go back, but carefully, and I like what I've done. Hard reset's like, nope. Yes, and you can still recommit them. Exactly right. You can still recommit them, and you can recommit them however you want. You could add them. You could amend commit number one. You could make a new commit. You can make a few commits, whatever. So for the soft reset, you just erase the commit messages for two, three, four. Yeah, exactly right. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I tried to like. Uh, that's not what I wanted. How do I like react or something? How's that? Why, something happened or are you just is that just a general observation that I'm not okay? No, I'm just happy that I'm happy that Hans um Hans got it. Okay. That is um Git reset soft. All all happy, all good. And we already talked about commit uh, amend. Okay, Hans got another question. For a hard reset, you erase not only the commit messages for two, three, and four, and also the work for two, three, four. Uh, am I correct? Yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Everything's gone. You go. You're you're rewinding time to the point at which the commit that you're resetting to was the most recent um, thing that you did. The graph would just look like one is the head. Exactly right. You erase everything that happened afterwards, afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Good, 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 good. All right. That is some Git stuff the first half of the lecture um if you would like to please i know i've noticed that um no one's filling out the feedback form anymore but that's fine um it's the end of the term i guess there's less and less value in submitting it isn't there um okay what are we going to learn off the break so i mentioned in the first half of the lecture but you weren't here because you were um where were you ar11 in bed or Um, no, I'm joking. Um, yeah, sleep, that's what I thought. Uh, the f so we're out of actual lecture content. So what I was hoping to do for the second half of the lecture is do um, recaps of sort of like a, you know, trip down memory lane or um, stuff that's causing us um, bother. So someone suggested that we are doing um, map reduce and filter, that we go over those again. Um, so we can do something like that. Um, is it, if there's just basically any lecture type content that's causing, you know, confusion that we want to just go over again, we can do that. Um, we have a few options then. So, because tomorrow we will talk about iteration four. So we'll do that tomorrow. Um, next week we have bonus lecture content. So today it's basically just a, a time to take it easy, recap, 
give you time to breathe. I don't want to slam you with new content because you're working on the, the project and stuff. Um, yeah, you can work on, yeah, that's fine. If you want to work on a lab, if that's, if you're happy with the content and that's more valuable to you, you can do that and keep the lecture on in the background or something if you want. Um, quick little HTML CSS demo. Yeah, we can do that. That'll, that's what we'll do next week, actually. Um, so we'll do like front ends next week. I can definitely talk about that. But so why don't we do, how do we do, what's the best way to do this? Do you want to just type, um, so here's all the lecture content. I'll send you the link. You can go through and just copy and paste the topic that's causing you. We'll do a Q&A. Should we do Q&A? What topic do we want to recap for today? I don't know what this is. I don't know what I've done. I think you can just put your answers in here <coughs> over the le over the next few minutes. Go get some tea or a coffee or a stretch or a bathroom break. Um, and just answer any questions. And now I've lost the... Okay, no, I'm back. Did everyone have a nice Easter? The weather was really nice in Sydney, if you're in Sydney. Okay, yeah, if you're working on... Yeah, no, me too, Han, me too. It went really quick. Oh, how's the Easter show? I've never been to it in Sydney. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, AR11. Blame um, trimesters, not me. No, <laughs> not really related to Easter. Yeah, I think it's just like a show. It's just a showground and it's a good weekend for it because it's public holidays. It's probably all that all that's going on there. I've never been. Is it worth going to? Is it for kids? Is it not too bad? Um, the other thing we can talk about is more advanced Git stuff that like. Um, I I run into. That's expensive. Yeah, everything's expensive here. Okay, I'm gonna get some water. I'll be back.
Okay. Um, we've been doing five hour daily meetings. Damn. So much stuff to use. But are you learning a lot? <laughs> that's, that's what we want. Um, 85% is good. Persistence coverage modeling deployment. Well, we can't do all of that in like 40 minutes, but we can definitely, yeah, that's a good mark. Oh, yeah, that one. Um, any upgrades to the espresso setups in SAS yet? Um, only minor. I have a, I don't know what you call it. You know, if you're into espresso, it's like the, the wires that come out of the thing to like disperse the grounds. And I have like a leveler. I don't know if they make a big difference. Honestly, I've, I've hit like a trough with my espresso. I'm not like very happy with it. I don't know. I think it's the beans. I need a better place to get beans. WDT tool. Am I going to get in trouble for searching this? Should I do it off the tab? Yes, that's it. Yeah, that thing. Why is it called WDT? Um, yeah, I got one of these. I don't know if it does anything. Where do you get your beans from if anyone else is into espresso? Yeah, I have one of those and I got like the thing that you spin to make it. Um, Pablo and Rasik? Yeah, you can probably get them from there. Okay, maybe I'll look. Um, learning is secondary to a good mark. <laughs> it's probably not a healthy mindset. It's not the Asian way. It's honestly, it's like the system is built to encourage good. M the system is built so like good students will optimize to get good marks. It's our fault, I think. It's like academia's fault, not your fault or uh, the Asian mindset's fault. It's the, yeah, it's the HSC. Like you're trained in HSC that the only thing that matters is the grade and not the learning. Like I, the, the HSC is really bad, I think, because it, all it prioritizes is memorization, not actual, in some cases, especially some courses and, in, and things like that. I don't think it's, yeah, it's our fault. I talk about this all the time internally. I don't know, some people like Richard Buckland has even spoken about this and I sort of kind of agree, but like the whole idea of having grades does cause this problem. If we just didn't have grades um, and it was all about the learning, I don't know. The challenge is, right, like if I got rid of grades and it was like pass or fail, um, would you do anything? Or like, would the average 1531 student do as much as they do now? Do you know what I mean? If the grades are purely serve as a motivator to make you meet five hours a day and you hate me, but you learn a lot, um, what's better in the end? I don't know, is the answer. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you maybe you guys would. I mean, the other thing to consider is that there's 700 students in this course and there's like 20 or 30 of you in the lecture. So what about everyone else? I don't know. I've tried it before. There's this, there is like this ungrading push. I don't know if it's the way. Grades are very useful. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, yeah, chat GPT in the future. G great question. Um, yep. Okay. Did I get any Q&A responses? I don't think I did. That's fine, but people can just type in the chat. Um, uh, Han, you've got two persistence, three coverage. What's number one? What's the number one thing? To give me one thing, Han, that you that you most want to go over. We can always look at old lectures for revision. Okay, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, we could do something different. HTML, CSS stuff. We can also talk about... Um, 
you mean, just mean like the basics of HTML and CSS? Like uh, front end stuff, basically? We can definitely do that. Um, yeah, we can do some advanced Git stuff. Okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Let me do a poll. What do we want to do? So we can do advanced Git. We can do simple front end. We could do, we could do um, persistence. I can show you some stuff I've done. I can do some real software. Uh, when I put say real, I'll put that in quotes. Real software project walkthroughs. Um, what else could we do? Oh, is that all? That's the amount of questions I can ask. There's a few options. Let's just pick one of these. Or we could do a recap of a previous um, thing. Yeah, yeah, you get your own server on CSC. That's nice. I mean, so like this, uh, the lecture slides for example uh, you know whenever we whenever i bring these up if you see they're, they're hosted on my server j renzella that's my csc server and there's a server running here oh it's actually not a server it's a static server but you can put like a server on your C um your csc server share your website who said that who said that they made one share, share yours if it's a public Okay, well, we, I don't, we definitely don't have time. Like, 6080 is the full front-end web course, but I can talk through some, some um, front-end projects, maybe, if we want to do that. I can show you my personal website. This is mine that I built. I built it. So, you know, like, Linktree? I was like... Because I had, like, a website with, like, actual content on it, and then I was um, always forgetting to update it. So I'm like, I oh, screw that. Like, things like LinkedIn and stuff update for me anyway so i just want to like link to everything and so i just built this pretty simply okay let's end the poll um 36 percent for simple front end stuff okay you guys are keen on front end stuff we can do that what do we want how do we want to do it okay like, why don't we do this we can Who's done any front end stuff before? <coughs> we can do front end, make a folder there. Index.html. Okay, all right, so the thing with web is that um, basically everything today is done with a framework now. Um, so you don't actually really ever write pure HTML, JavaScript, and CSS anymore. Everything's done with a framework like React, Angular, S Svelte, whatever, pick your, pick your poison. But the basics of... Um, The basics of uh, web haven't changed. You have a HTML file which contains content and structure. <coughs> um, you've got an index.js file that contains logic. You should be very familiar with JavaScript. And you've got styles.css which contains styles. Um, Um, let's get, 
something really simple here. So this is an example of <coughs> a super simple HTML template. So you're basically you're saying, yeah, expect a HTML file to be contained. You always start with a HTML tag and then websites usually have a head and a body. The head is the title of the page. The body contains everything that goes in the actual content. And in this example, there's a paragraph. Anything in this uh, body tag will appear on the page, just like this paragraph in our content. So what we can actually do is open this in Finder, open this in Chrome, and you can see that just opening this plain HTML file, we see the contents of that body tag. And if you also notice, do you see the title of the tab? This is the title of the web page, is coming from this title tag. So the title tag actually sets the title field, which Chrome or whatever browser you're using pulls into the title of the tab, and the content goes in here. And there's lots of things we can do here. We can put text, we can put a header, right? We come over here, we refresh, we get a header. Um, we can put images, we can put whatever. There's lots and lots of stuff we can put now. But the content, the overall structure goes in here. We can put a button, for example, stuff like that. Um, now, HTML includes if I want to start styling this um, page in the head tag I can add um, that I want to load a styles file and then when I have this styles file we can start styling things so for example um, I can say I want every paragraph yeah this is not a bad idea to be uh, red okay and if that all links up correctly which it does when I refresh you know I'm able to, to target specific things in the con in the in the html file um, to change how it's displayed and there's lots of things we can do you know i can make it um, i can make it style it can be italic right and now it's italic so HTML is content, structure, CSS is, is targeting and style. So you always have to target somehow and then you always have to um, determine what we do in the style. And then and then similarly for, for JavaScript, we put another script in here index.js, which loads um, the JavaScript file, which contains some logic. Um, looks a lot like JSON. Is there a connection uh, for CSS? It's it, yeah, it does look the same, but it's different. It's not. A, it's not. It's it's different. It's different. The, this looks the same, but this is just a selector for like. Um, I'll give you another example, right? So there's also this idea of classes. So if I have another paragraph title, uh, another paragraph, this is another paragraph. It's gonna be red and italic as well because CSS is saying that every paragraph should be red and italic. But what if I don't want every paragraph to be red and italic? I can use this thing called classes. Um, so I can say that the class is equal to red italic or reddit that's um, weird and then i can say that well i don't want every paragraph to be red and italic i just want any class which has the name red it red italic then if i refresh that you can say only the second one you know what i actually ask to do only um classes with this red IT get that styling. So, and you can already see that this has started shifting away from valid JSON. Yeah, and you can use um, IDs and things like that. Yeah, Reddit, maybe that's how they started, who knows? I think it's like, I read it. 
Um, JavaScript, um, you know, it just contains some logic. Um, I'll talk about connecting with the backend um, after. Let's do a really brief overcap. Uh, JavaScript contains logic. Um, so, for example, let's do a really simple. So, let's put a button. Um, and then we go button on click HTML. I always like, whenever I'm looking at HTML documentation, I always like to do the Mozilla documentation, MDM. Yep. I always like to look at the Mozilla one. I think it's quite good. Um, all right, so you can see that's making a button. We can style buttons, and then I want like the click on click. HTML button on click MDM. Click event. Yeah, this is what we want. No, it's block HTML. Here we go. Okay, let's copy. I don't know if we need to be in a form, so let's just copy this. Okay, this isn't too bad. We can probably do this. So this button's got um, this on-click event on it. So when it's clicked, it's gonna run this JavaScript. This is just JavaScript. So an alert should... So there's a button. Oh, the button doesn't have any, I don't, you know, boop. Me. So I click that and you can see this alert pops up. So alerts are built in JavaScript function that within a browser opens up an alert, but we can also make it call a function that we write ourselves. So my click. So then in JavaScript, we can do my click. And then this could have an alert. Hello world. Um, and we can now do some stuff in the, in the, in the logic itself. So that's like the real, that's like the simplest possible way you can, you can have some content that's styled and that's um, joint to some logic in JavaScript somehow. Doesn't the script have to be at the bottom of the page to work? No. You can put scripts in the head, you can put scripts in the bottom, it just changes the order that they're loaded. For something of this size and thing, it, does, it really doesn't matter. Um, this is like how you would make websites in the, in the 80s and, or in the 90s. Um, things are a lot more complex today. There's an entire course, um, Comp 6080, taught by Hayden, <coughs> which is front-end development. Um, we, we can't sort of... Basically, this is how it started. We do more and more complex things. You've got live data, data that's changing, large models. And so what happens is it becomes too hard to build things like this. So be, people built these frameworks. Um, that allow you to do more powerful things a lot more simply. For example, connecting to APIs and things like that. Um, loading l complex libraries and, and all this, all this, um, all this stuff. Um, 2023 popular web frameworks. It's gonna be probably React on top. What's a good reputable one? GitHub, do they have their own lists? Is React not here? That's weird. Um, This is just some person that's doing it there. But this looks okay. <coughs> yeah, this looks fine. Um, there we go. Percent of Stack Overflow questions. You can see by 
far f- React is um, is at the top. Angular JS is purple. Angular JS is the old Angular that's dying, which is good. Rain is Angular, so it looks like it's the second most popular framework. I'm an Angular. I use Angular all the time. I think it's quite good. Vue.js is a bit below Angular, right? So you can see everyone's basically um, using these sort of frameworks um, to do stuff. I can show how you would connect with a backend. What's a good project? What's a good project? show that's nice and simple. Mm. I mean, we can run through the 1531 project. Oh no, it's not going to let me log in to GitLab. Oh, it wants it too fast to code. I'm not going to do that. Do you deploy GitLab? Hey, I'll stop it. You're going to stress me out. Um... I mean, you're paying for it. Interesting. Um, I am. I can check my desktop. Oh God, you guys are gonna stress me out. Are you still learning things at least, I hope? All right, so this is a large front end. This is an Angular project. We can have, we have some source here. You have the actual application and in each of these. So what we looked at when we did this example, right? You have this HTML file. Um, and the entire application is contained in this HTML file. As applications grow really large, you actually want to break down the application into components. And so in, an ap- in a large application, think of like YouTube or anything like that, every, you know, every component here has its own HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So the chat, the video player, you know, this component is probably a component here. The stats component is its own component. So everything's broken up. And you can see, like, in a modern project, that's how it works. Um, So, like, here we go. Here's the header. The header has its own HTML file. And this is just the HTML for the header. You got styles just for the header. And you got some logic just for the header. Um, And then when some things happen, you need to connect to a backend. Those aren't part of components. That might be part of your API. And you have different ways of doing this for different projects. Um, But basically, at some point, you can connect to some server somewhere and um, do do a HTTP request um, from the front end. This is a bit of a complex example. I just didn't have another repo ready. We'll do do a better um, discussion of front end next week when I'm prepared for it. Um, but yeah, web development's really good. Don't snuff your nose at it. Um, most software that people use is a website, right? Is a web app or a website. So if you want to build stuff that people use, it's probably going to be a web web app. So get get used to that idea. 
That's what I think. Um, oh, what else did we want to talk about? Some real project advanced Git. What were the other advanced Git topics? Does having your own page help with employment? Um, probably not. Probably not, unless you do something you know cool or impressive. I mean, that's exactly why I sort of like stripped mine back. Because I, I don't think people really look at it. In fact, we can look at like analytics for my personal website. Oh, that's not nice. Let's see how many people view my... I can review your page off screen. I can do it on screen. <laughs> if we were to do some on screen reviews, we can do that. Okay, actually, here's, oh, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, there you go. So, like, how long is this? In the last 90 days, 85 people have viewed my website. Actually, that's more than I would have thought. They're on there for 12 seconds. <laughs> They're not doing much, are they? I don't think it's like, it's super important unless you're notable and you've got a blog on there for example maybe then that could be good it's it's about the content i think having like a linkedin is really good have a linkedin that's up to date have a nice photo uh, um i wonder what they're doing <laughs> 12. um where do you see like what they're clicking Put ads on my homepage? Yeah, I'll make like three cents. Explore. What are they clicking? Oh, can, I'm not able to. Oh my God, you even know when they scroll. That's insane. File download. Okay, interesting. But yeah, a good LinkedIn LinkedIn's good. LinkedIn's how I got this job. I'm a big I'm actually a f I mean it's a bit of a eye roll on LinkedIn, but um if you have a professional page and you up keep it up to date with what you're working on and where you're working, um you can meet people that are hiring, doing stuff like that. You can add me on LinkedIn. Just mention that you're a one five three one student. Um, okay, 15 minutes. I mean, obviously it's obvious that um, if you need to head off and do some lab stuff or something like that, you can feel free. Um, but okay. We can look at some more useful, what are some useful Git? Intermediate git commands. Let's look at this. And let's do um Yeah, git config's a good one. I think you've already done that, right? You've all done git config. Git diff. Have we spoken about git diff actually? Surely. Surely. The final labs are doing 15 minutes. Are they really? Oh, that's because of the public holiday. We didn't think that through very well, did we? Maybe we can change that. Um, labs. 
what's for the best that it's due or that it's yeah that's i mean that's why it the public holidays always screw us over uh we'll just leave it yeah it's not ideal i understand why you might be prior yeah focusing on on, a, on that stuff Git cherry pick is very useful. Do we want to talk about git cherry pick as the last bit of the lecture? Or do you want to just work on your labs? Maybe some of you already done your labs. Oh, git bisect is also very cool. Um, yeah, if if um, we can definitely do that, Loom. If everyone needs the day, does everyone need the day? I mean, it's not really fair. I can maybe. What's more reasonable is I could extend it to tonight, like midnight tonight or something. Would that be better? I don't want to extend it too long because then, like you said, it's the project and maybe not everyone will be aware of it. But it is a kind of rough that it's due during the lecture. That was a mistake or an oversight, let's say. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I've just decided. Let's do that. I didn't know that. Sorry. I didn't, well, I did know, but I didn't um, think it through. Uh, lab deadline moved to midnight tonight. I all, apo oops, apologies for setting the lab deadline to be during the lecture it will it has been moved to midnight tonight uh, the 11th uh, obviously 2023 all the best okay thank you <laughs> okay <laughs> all right And loom. Okay, I better let the tutors know as well, shouldn't I? <coughs> ah, don't look at my screen. sentence yeah no chat gpt was involved isn't that funny okay what am i doing uh tutors Okay, done. Yeah, you can put that on your resume now or your LinkedIn. Okay, um, do you want to quickly talk about cherry picks or are, are we happy to just leave it and chit chat? It's probably going to take more than five minutes to talk about cherry picks. Cherry picking. How many people are even here? This lecture has gone a bit off the rails, hasn't it? Where's YouTube gone? Oh, there's still 20 people here. Why don't we just talk about the concepts of cherry picking? We won't do a demo. I don't think we have time for a demo, and then we can just chit chat. Um, cherry picking is very useful, right? So um, let's say you've got uh, a branch with a bunch of commits, basically. Uh, in fact, I can do the whiteboard.
Yeah, okay, let's do this example again. So delete let's delete this. So you got a bunch of commits in some branch. This could be like branch one. Oops. Branch one. And then um, you have this other branch over here that's just got, you know, one dot TS. And uh, branch one is in development, right? It's a feature branch and it's a work in progress, but you realize that um, you need to very quickly push out. Um, oh my God, this iPad's got 1% battery. Let's see how we go. You need to push out another feature, another release, but you need to take some of the commits that were on branch one, but not all of them because they're not all ready, for example. Or like you want... Uh, let's say, say this is another example. You want to get file two over that came in commit two, but you don't want commit three or commit four. I don't think that's a good example. Actually, let's say you want you want commit two and you want commit four. I think that's a better example. But you don't want commit three. So you can't just branch from commit four. You can't just branch from commit two. Or you could branch for commit two, for example, but then you want you still want this commit four, which is the challenge. How do we get some changes over from a branch, but not everything? Does that make sense? So I don't want commit three. Three dot ts needs more work. It's not ready to bring over, and I've already got commit number one. And so this is where cherry picking comes in. You can cherry pick, right? Like you're literally picking cherries from a tree, specific commits from the original branch. Uh, where, 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 where are we? Wouldn't commit four have the changes from commit three? No, you're only, okay, so, okay, good question, good question. Commit four only has the changes that were contained in commit four. So if commit four was responsible for adding four dot ts, it doesn't have anything to do with 3.ts. Now, yes, it, commit four was built after commit three, but commit four itself did not add 3.ts. Does that make sense? And it didn't use 3.ts. Exactly right. A commit only contains the changes localized to what it does. Um, yeah, and so basically you go to this branch two, for example, and you go git cherry pick the commit ID or the hash. So I could go, you know, git cherry pick, uh, let's say two, and then I can do the same thing. Oh, my iPad just crashed. It just died. Really nice. Oh, yeah, I didn't have the whiteboard open anyway. So I can do git cherry pick two, and it will bring over... Let me go into this crazy lasso tool again. Two. And then I can get cherry pick four. Oops. Oh, it's loading. And it brings over four.ts. But importantly, it doesn't bring over 3.ts. And so I've, I've, ch I've built my own, you know, little git history here only with the commits that I wanted. And that's, that's cherry picking. It's, it's very, very useful. So it brings over commit two, which added 2.ts. It brings over commit four, which added 4.ts. When is this useful? It's use this is the great this is a good example. Like so branch one, someone's working on, you know, all of these files. But it's gonna take a few months, let's say. It's gonna take a few months. But 4.ts, right? So let's say this is ready. This is ready. This is not ready. 
there's a problem with 3.ts. So we can release this, we can release this, but we don't want to, we can't release this yet. So because it's in the middle of these commits, I can't branch from here because I'll get three. Does that make sense? I can't branch because I'll bring over three, which I don't want. I could branch from commit two, but then what am I going to do? How am I going to get four? I couldn't pull it because I'll have the same problem by bringing in three. So I can specify which commits are the ones that I want. You can pull the changes relevant to your work. Exactly. You're pulling over individual commits that you want. Does that make sense? So now I can release this. This is good to go because this was ready and this was ready, but this needs more work. And so whoever's working on this can keep working on, uh, on file number three and make some, you know, more commits. They could be working on more changes to 3.ts. Make sense? That's a that's another great example, fake olive. So someone added some helper files that you want, but you don't want to bring everything else that they've added because they're not ready yet. That's a that's a great uh, example. Basically, it's very simple. Some other branch has some commits that you want, but you don't want all of their commits. So you can cherry pick specific commits. You can, and you can actually cherry pick a range of commits. So you can do the, you can do like, um, you know, something like two dot 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 uh, four. We'll bring two to four over. Yeah, it's it's not like a it's not really a pool because you're making new commit like you're you're making new commits and applying them one by one. So I wouldn't say it's like a pool, but yeah, you're just I think like cherry picking is the best word for it. You're cherry picking the changes that you want, and you can do a few little things to do that, like a range. Um, Git bisect is one of my favorite Git tools that you'll never use. I, I I'm gonna posit that like I don't know what percentage of people actually use it. Um, there was one time in my entire c career so far that I've had to use it. Um, it's it's such a cool concept though. Do you want to end the lecture on bisect? Um, so, this is a real story. This is a real story. In fact, it was this project. Um, it was the it was the Doubtfire project that it came up with. So, Doubtfire is a is a web a web application. Um, and there's a bunch of things. There's a, there's a chat in it. There's, it's, it's just a big web app. Like, think of any web app. And there was a bug, there was a bug in Doubtfire, right? So something was wrong. Something was not working right. Um, and to... Um, we don't know... We didn't know where the bug was coming from. You know, some bugs are just, like, very hard to nail down. It, it was some cascade of events that was causing this bug, but we could reproduce the bug. Um, but we don't know like what file caused it. We don't know when it started. It wasn't a very obvious bug, right? Um, so we don't know when the bug was introduced, but we knew what the bug was and we knew how to reproduce it. Um, and that is the perfect example for when you would want to use git bisect. So what you do is you write a script, right? Um, that returns basically false if you found the bug, true if the code is working. Does that make sense? So let's say like you've got these comments and for some reason um, the second last comment was always null. Let's just say. So for some reason the second last comment was always null. It shouldn't have been, and we don't know why. The, the most recent comment's not null. The, the comment is there, it's just not being displayed properly. It's in the database, whatever. So we write a script that asserts, let's say, comments, you know, something like that. We is not equal to null. 
Does it make sense? So we wrote a script that could test the problem. That either returns true or false. If true, we have good code. If false, we have bad code. Does that make sense? So far? Whoops, ignore that. Yes. Um, you can say, for example, um, yeah, it's sort of meant for debugging, exactly. I, I, and I, I'm pretty sure, like, this is when this happened, we knew it was working, like, at some point. Well, it had been working. It doesn't, it, this doesn't matter, though. So you, you get, um, you get a good, you know, the, the latest known good commit and the earliest known bad commit. So if you have like one, you know, does that make sense? So you might have like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten commits. Um, this was known working and here it's broken. So you get the commit the ID of two and ten. So you go git bisect start. That's the uh, you paste a commit where the problem does not occur, which is good commit ID exactly right. And then on the branch you run um, git bisect start, git bisect bad, and then you go git bisect good. You give it the known good commit. It I think it always assumes that the most recent commit is still broken, which actually totally makes sense. So you would go basically git bisect known good to something like that. Sorry, uh, git bisect good commit ID, whatever. It's two. And then you give it the... Um, you give it the script that you want to run. And what it does is, it does a binary search of your commits. So it goes git checkout to run script returns true. Okay, so it didn't happen in, it. What the problem wasn't introduced in, in, um, in two. Then it goes like git checkout, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. Something like five. Run script returns false. So five, commit five is broken. So then it does like git check. It does it automatically. It goes git checkout three. Run script returns. Let's say it returns true. So three was fine. So then therefore we found found the commit that introduced the change. And you can view what changed in commit four to see what caused the problem. It helps you f focus. Now, if commit four is a massive commit, you're probably not in a good position anyway. But if git four, if, if commit four is, is really small, you know that it's one of the changes here that broke it. Because commit five, we tested. Sorry, uh, this is a bad example. Uh, oh yeah, false, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, five was broken. Yeah. Then you, you yeah, 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 this was, uh, this was fine. Um, so, you know, git commit four broke it because git commit three was fine, right? So then you can go and look, do a git diff and see what changed and then, oh yeah. Um, it's just, a, it's such a cool, does a binary search of the commit history, checking out a thing and uh, at this point it's up to you to check the test of your code. Um, so you can do a manually, manual test like you can't always write a script. Like you could just load the website and see if it's something's broken. But if you, you you can have a script that runs and um, helps you find what went wrong. But this is only useful really in really large applications with a lot of different people writing different commits and code where you don't know exactly what introduced the problem. Anyway, it's something useful to keep up your sleeve. That's the thing with Git is like 
you learn these weird things that are useful like once every three years. But anyway, thank you for today's lecture. I know it was a bit of a weirder one. Um, tomorrow we'll talk about um, iteration four, the individual iteration. Um, do you think GPT-5 will make software engineers degrees redundant? No, I don't think so at all. At least not GPT-5. We're going to see what happens with LLMs. I don't, I don't think it's, um, there's a lot of hype around it. It's clearly something very interesting is happening, but I don't know. We'll see. And the other thing is if, if it does start coming after software engineers, we're not going to be the first people that lose our jobs, I think. So, I don't know, society will have to catch up somehow. But what will probably happen is that, like, the really basic boilerplate code that we spend a lot of time writing that we shouldn't bother with, probably, like, that will be sort of automated. But that's a good thing. Um, I don't want to write, like, like, for example, when we did that HTML example, like, I don't want to write this, this, this. It's the same, everything. I, boilerplate generation is, is going to go, I think, which is really good. But yeah, and this is what Rob was saying. If His lecture was awesome. If you didn't watch it, you should watch it. But it doesn't come up with anything new. It just synthesizes info already on the in internet. Exactly. So this stuff's everywhere on the internet. It's going to do a really good job of synthesizing it. Um, but, you know, maybe this code that's doing something unique... Maybe it can generate it. Maybe it can't. Maybe it generates a really bad example. Um, you know. Don't we synthesize information about what we know? Yeah, but we are trained on much less data than GPT. Right. So we're, we're like definitely... Um, hopefully, ideally, we're learning concepts and ideas more than tokens whereas ChatGPT is learning tokens primarily right like it's spitting out one token at a time however it's clearly learning some concepts um we'll see i don't know we'll see what happens yeah okay thank you all so much have a great week Good luck with the labs. Good luck with the project. I know it's a lot of work, but we're almost at the end. And I look as all I hope AR11 and others that you're learning a lot of software engineering. Um, I know we're killing you, but I just hope you're enjoying it to a little degree. <laughs> anyway, this is the worst part of term. You'll feel better soon. 